Heavenly Father, I'm asking that each of us hear that call this morning in Jesus' name. I believe that you've brought us here for a purpose, to hear your voice, to get a revelation from heaven on high. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would open up our ears, that you'd open up our hearts and our minds and allow us to discern your voice in the name of Jesus Christ. Like Samuel, Father God, many of us are are wanting to hear God's voice, but we're not sure what it is. Today, make it real. Today, make it loud. Today, make it so tangible, Father God, that literally we turn around in our seat thinking that God is right there with us. I pray this today in Jesus' holy and precious name. And together everyone says, amen Amen and amen. Today I want to talk to you about the pause that refreshes. In 1929, the Coca-Cola bottling company came out with that, that phrase, the pause that refreshes. And their thinking was this, in the middle of a chaotic day, in the middle of your your normal hurriedness, in the middle of of all of the busyness of life, maybe at at three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon, you can open up a a bottle of Pepsi. You guys know the sound I'm talking about? And take a couple of guzzles and it would be the pause that refreshes. I want you to know that the Bible already talks about a a pause that that refreshes that's, that's far superior to that, that's far better than that, and it's something called the Sabbath. Say Sabbath. Sabbath. Now, I know that's something that you've probably heard of before. It's it's probably maybe you even grew up with it. In in the church that I grew up with, uh, Sabbath uh, following was, was very legalistic. And so I grew up with kind of a a negative connotation when I heard this idea of Sabbath. And and what it made me think is is that I had to to dress up and wear a tie and and, and follow the rules and do all this stuff and go to church and all that kind of stuff. And, and, And so sometimes it made church not so fun to be at. Reminds me of a story of a a couple. The alarm goes up off on a Sunday morning and and the wife nudges her husband and says, honey, it's time to go to church. And he goes, I don't want to go to church today. And he puts the pillow over his face. She gets out of bed. She goes to the shower. She gets herself ready. She comes back about 15, 20 minutes later. And she says, honey, it's time to get up for church. And he says, I'm not going to church today. I don't like those people there. They're not very nice people. The sermons aren't even any good. She says, you have to go to church. He says, give me three good reasons why I have to go to church. Well, well, number one, today's the Sabbath day. It's Sunday. You need to go to church. No, number two, you're a 40-year-old man. You know better. And number three, you're the pastor. <laughs> Trust me, that wasn't me this morning, all right? But you know what I'm talking about? In in the Old Testament, there seems to be so much rules associated with Sabbath. But in the New Testament, Jesus says this in Mark chapter 2, verse 27. He says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And and when I was a young kid, it it was all about obligation and legalism and and the do's and don'ts. and, and, And yet Jesus is plainly trying to communicate that the Sabbath wasn't about that stuff. The Sabbath was for your benefit. The Sabbath was a, a good thing. And so I want you to, to think of a couple of uh, ideas here. Number one is the Sabbath is a pause. In the Old Testament, yes, it was a, it was a complete day. But in the New Testament, it's, it's a pause. It's a break. It's any time period that you disconnect from the normal flow of time in life and you connect with something divine. So it can be seconds. It can be an hour. It can be a day. It can be a week. It can be a sabbatical that goes on for four, six, eight weeks, six months, maybe even a year. But in the Old Testament, Sabbath was a command. It's one of the big 10 commands. That's why why most of us remember it. In Deuteronomy chapter five, verse 12, it says this, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God has commanded you. So that makes it 
not a matter of our choice, according to the Old Testament. It's something we had to do. God said that the Sabbath is, is holy. That means it's sacred. That means it's, it's set apart. That means it specifically has to be different from the other six days of the week. So in Deuteronomy 5.13, this is what it says. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work so everyone may rest. And that's where we get a lot of our ideas about Sabbath, that you're not supposed to work, that you're you're supposed to rest, and, and, and this rest was, was different from the other days of the week. That means you got to have some fun once in a while. You got to, got to get away from the normal routine of life. In verses 14 and 15, it goes on and says you need to remember on the Sabbath that you're supposed to remember that, that you were not always living in the promised land. Remember, the Israelites are, are living in the promised land now, and so in the promised land, you work real hard for six days, and, and one day, you don't have to work. But when they were in Egypt, you're supposed to remember you used to be in slavery. And while you were in slavery, the Egyptians made you work seven days a week. You had to be on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There was no time off, no leisure whatsoever, no real family time of any kind. But here in the promised land, now that I've delivered you from all that, I want you to take one day a week to remember that your you're not God, you don't have to fight, you don't have to labor, I will take care of you in every, say every, in every area of your life. Just trust me. Be still and know that I'm God. In the Old Testament, this was serious business. Exodus 35, 2, whoever does any work on the Sabbath will be put to death. That seems extreme. That seems crazy in our minds. But we need to understand that, that God was trying to, to communicate not just to the Israelites. He was communicating to everybody that Sabbath was a, a sign. Let me give you an example. When uh, the flood was over and Noah made it through the flood, what was the sign of the new covenant? Who could tell me? A rainbow, that's right. A rainbow was the sign that God gave that, that Noah and God were in a special covenantal relationship. And so many years later, Abraham is being called into a new land and he, and he has a son and, and he says, you know what, I need to have a sign that, that really represents faith. And so the sign with Abraham was circumcision. The firstborn male and all males had, had to be circumcised. That was the sign. And so now Moses delivers the children of Israel out of Egypt and the sign is the Sabbath. Think of this, in all of the, the world, there was no Sabbath day, there was no Sunday, there was no weekend. Every day was exactly the same, except for the people of Israel. The only people, the only nation on the entire planet that seemed to not take advantage of, of all the time that they had. They did nothing on one day. So in Ezekiel 20, 20, God says, keep my Sabbaths holy that they may be a sign between us, then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Be still and know that I am God. It, not, not in the busyness of life, not in the chaos of life, not in the crazy of life, but in the stillness of life. Now, this is where we struggle as New Testament Christians. We forget that the, that the law isn't completely bindable on us today. That there are what's called the ceremonial laws. Those are the dietary restrictions, the, the special and holy days. And then there's the moral law. The moral law, like you shouldn't murder, you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't commit adultery. God still wants us to do anything that has to do with morality. But anything that has to do with a sign, anything that is, that is communicating a spiritual truth in a physical way, New Testament Christians don't have to do it in the same way any longer. It's called a shadow. Say shadow. Shadow. Colossians 2, 16 and 17, therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. 
Sabbath is a shadow. Verse 17, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Jesus Christ. Now be careful. You see, sometimes under grace, we go so far and say, well, that means I don't have to go to church anymore at all. That's not what it's trying to communicate. It's trying to communicate that there is, there's a deeper spiritual truth associated to taking time out than you ever imagined. That Jesus literally fulfilled the Sabbath and can give us a rest that is far superior to anything that, that they ha- had even in the Old Testament. When they went to the promised land, the best that it got, Jesus has something even better to offer. That's why Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Hey, anybody here a little weary? Just let me see your hands. Right, you're a little weary. Anybody burdened at all? You, you, you've got problems, struggles, difficulties. If that's you, and I, I'm sure if I went far enough, I could get everybody to raise their hands because that's how I seem to live life. I'm always tired. I'm always a little anxious. And God says, if you are, come to me and I will give you real rest. Jesus gives the real rest that the Sabbath day just foreshadowed. It was just hinting at. Jesus is like Moses. He's our deliverer. He will set you free from from all the taskmasters of this world. He will set you free from sin. He will set you free from worry and anxiety. He'll set you free from addictions. He'll set you free from doubt and fear and stress and everything else. Here's the problem with the Israelites in the Old Testament is when they quit following Sabbath, when they quit spending that one day with God, then they would start reviving things in their heart that God had already removed from their lives. I find the same thing happens with Christians. When we get saved, we get so excited that we show up in church all the time, that we're there Sunday mornings, we come to the call on Sunday nights, we get involved in a life group, we, we just want more and more and more and more and more of God. But there comes a point where, where we kind of have this thing under control and we go, you know what, I, I don't need to go to church this Sunday morning. And you know, God will be gracious with me, God will forgive me, it's not that big, big a deal. And all of a sudden, what God has removed from our lives, some of the sins, some of the worries, some of the doubts, starts getting revived because we've not spent time with God. See, in the New Testament, Sabbath is a, is a gift. Mark 2.27 again says that, that Sabbath was made for man. Remember, it's any pause. It's any break in the action. It's any moment that, that you get off the treadmill of life and reorient yourself towards God. See, I think of it this way. Uh, life is, on a, is a merry-go-round, and we're all going around and around and around. And if you don't get off the merry-go-round, you're going to lose your merry. The joy of the Lord won't be your strength any longer. You'll get bored. You'll get stuck in some kind of rut. We need to understand that, that Sabbath, taking one day off per week, is very, very practical. There's, there's an old saying, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Why? Because we need some play. We are made, we are created to, to take one day off every week. It's in our biology It's not something that man came up with. Man didn't say, you know what, let's create a a calendar and and every week's going to have seven days in it. No, God created this. God worked for six days and on the seventh day he rested, the scripture says. Was that because God was tired? Anybody know? No. God has no needs. He wasn't tired. He was creating a pattern for living for humanity. We were supposed to work for six days and take a seventh day off. We are made in God's image. So for us to to fulfill that image, we have to take a day off on a regular basis. It's natural. It's normal. 
In the late 1700s, there was something called the French Revolution. And during the French Revolution, they wanted to kick Christianity out of the door. And so what they said is, we've got to change the calendar. Because they believed that the seven-day work week was established by Christianity because it's found in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And so they created a new calendar, and the new calendar had a 10-day week. And you would work nine days, and you'd get the 10th day off. And this went on for a couple of years, and they noticed something weird happening. People started having more accidents People started getting sick more often, and they discovered in less than 20 years that this calendar didn't work, and they had to repeal it and go back to the seven-day-a-week calendar. Why? Because Sabbath is practical. Sabbath is also spiritual. Say Sabbath. Doesn't that sound spiritual to you? I mean, I I hear the word, and, and, and I think you know, oh, something holy. I I think something sacred. I I think, you know, I'm supposed to reflect on God. Here's the thing that, that boggles my mind is Adam and Eve were made on the sixth day. So their first full day as a human being was Sabbath. Their first full day in operation as people was the Sabbath day. They weren't made or born into work. They were born into Sabbath. They they were born into an opportunity to walk in the cool of the day with God himself. So Sabbath is all about reconnecting with God. It's about spending time with him. So, So people say, Pastor, are you telling us there's no Sabbath in the New Testament? I'm saying what what Paul says, that if you want to celebrate a Sabbath, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. But there is still a principle that is even more real than celebrating just one day. And that principle is you need to spend regular time with God. So no, we don't have a Sabbath in the New Testament. The Sabbath was Friday night to Saturday night. What we have is Sunday. God gave us something better than the Sabbath. It's called the Lord's Day. Who can say amen to that? The Lord's Day is about resurrection. The Lord's Day is about newness. The Lord's Day is about beginning your week with God rather than ending your week because you're so tired and exhausted you have to go into a Sabbath time. No, no, no. You can start your week with God. You can have a a vision for what your week is going to be about. You can anticipate everything that God's going to do. That means Sabbath is extremely flexible. In the Old Testament, limited to one day. In the New Testament. It's any pause, any break, any moment, any day that interrupts the normal flow of time for something divine. That's why David says in Psalm 90 verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We need to be smarter with our calendars. We need to be smarter with our time designs. We need to be smarter with how we manage our our weeks and our months. We're all given the same amount of time, but we need to build more margin into those days. I was saddened when I heard this quote by Bill Gates. In an interview, he said, religion's not very efficient. There's a lot more I could be doing on a Sunday morning. He's missing the whole point. We're not called human doings. We're called human beings. The scripture says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. We're supposed to be still? Sunday morning isn't necessarily about what our assignments are. It's not what our obligations are. It's about being in the presence of God. Time loses its beauty when every day is the same. That's why we have birthdays and holidays and anniversaries and vacations. Sabbath time is just a higher quality of time than anything else. Sabbath is where eternity and time meet. 
It's where God shows up. So we must be intentional about Sabbath. We need to make Sunday morning services with God and with one another a priority. We need to make life groups a priority. We need to make our devotionals, whether they're in the morning or at night, a priority. Not because it's an obligation. Not because it's something else we have to do. It's where you recharge It's where you become what God wants you to become. And and you need to see every moment where you're delayed as an opportunity for Sabbath. So yesterday morning, I'm here finishing up my notes. I send my notes on Sabbath. Sabbath is about rest and relaxation and recreation and and all that kind of stuff. So I send my notes away and I get in the car to go pick up Robin for for lunch. And I've got nothing else to do the rest of the day. And I hit a stoplight. And then I hit a second stoplight. And then I hit a third stoplight and I'm no longer a Christian any longer. (laughs) What is it? I I was in a hurry. And I started getting frustrated. I started getting angry. I started getting mad that that the stoplights were delaying me from my encounter with God. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit rises up inside of me and says, maybe God wants to spend a moment with you. And all of a sudden, I was like arrested in my heart. And I was like, okay. Every stoplight's going to be a Sabbath moment with you, Lord. Every stoplight that I sit at for anywhere from five to, to, to five minutes, because that's how long they feel sometimes, I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to pray. I'm going to say, Lord, what is it you want to speak into my heart? And this is what God has been speaking into my heart over the last week, that Sabbath is a rehearsal for heaven. Sabbath is a rehearsal. When we once a week or twice a week or however often we get to do this, when we get to spend time with God, we're rehearsing for what heaven is going to be like someday. Yes. So let me give you a couple of clues. Number one, heaven's going to be all about rest. So Sabbath should be about rest. Hebrews 4.9 says there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. So Sabbath is, is a time out from the craziness of the world. Sabbath is a pause from the demands that come upon you. Sabbath is an opportunity for you to turn the reins of your life over to God and say, God, I trust you in this moment. And it's okay on Sabbath to have some fun. Say fun. That's okay. Recreation, a recreation of your your being is what's supposed to take place. That's why in Nehemiah chapter 8, remember this last week? We're in Nehemiah chapter 8, and it says it's the first day of the seventh month. Well, if you look in Leviticus, you find out that the first day of the seventh month is a Sabbath. So last week, when they're reading the scriptures, do you you guys remember we we were doing this last week? When when they're reading the scriptures, they start crying, they start mourning, they start sorrowing in their heart, and Nehemiah and Ezra, they jump up and they go, no, 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 you guys are doing Sabbath all wrong. It's not about mourning, it's not about being sad about the past, it's all about where God's going to take you. It's all about a, a celebration. So we want you to make some food, and we want you to go home. We want you to have some food, some fun, some fellowship, and just enjoy the presence of God. That's what was supposed to take place. But for some of us, and I'm talking about the, the super spiritual, and I'm using that phrase tongue in cheek just so you know. Some of the super spiritual think that fun or play is a sin. They believe that that play is irresponsible and that that in order for a day to be holy, then all you can do is sit, maybe raise a hand, maybe sing a song, maybe read the Bible, and that's it. That's not what the Scripture teaches. The Scripture teaches that unless you become like a child, you can't even enter the kingdom of heaven. And so after this service, I'll be in the foyer. Anyone who wants to play leapfrog? Why don't you go home today and have a pillow fight with your children or your grandchildren? 
Why don't you go home this afternoon and play some board games? Don't sit down and watch another football game. Don't sit down and watch something on TV. Spend some time with your family, conversing, talking, laughing, playing a game. That's what God wants you to do on Sabbath. It's about, number three, restoration. This is the recharging of the battery on the inside of you. So there's a a physical component to this. If we don't get proper rest, if we don't unplug from the world once in a while, if we don't lower the stress levels and get a spiritual oil change every now and then, we're going to end up sick. Have you ever run so hard that you got the flu and you knew it was because you were running so hard? This has happened to me, and, and, and I'm in the ministry. I'm supposed to know better than this, and, but especially during Christmas season, the, the season that's supposed to be all about our Savior, all about Jesus Christ, and, and we just get so wrapped up in the Christmas season and going to parties and buying gifts that, that immediately after Christmas is over, you, you get the flu or, or you get a cold or, or something like that. That could be because you're going too hard. For some of us, it leads to high blood pressure, ulcers, heart attacks. It can affect the mind because we get angrier and frustrated and depressed and there's an inability to sleep. 14 million Americans have prescription for sleeping pills. That's because we can't turn the mind off. If you don't choose to slow down your bodies or your mind, they will slow down for you. Two more thoughts on this right here. One is that the Jewish Sabbath began at night. So the Jewish Sabbath began with rest. It began by going to sleep. And once they woke up, they were ready to do the things that that God wanted them to do. But it started with sleep. And the second thought about this is, is I got just a question. When did most of Jesus' miracles take place? Who can tell me? What day? Right, the Sabbath, Saturday. Most of Jesus' miracles took place on Saturday. Now, why is that? Because Jesus is trying to give you a clue as to what Sabbath is supposed to be about. It's about restoration of the body and the soul and the spirit. It's about clarifying your thinking. It's about making your body feeling better. It's about reconnecting with the God of the universe and getting the strength that you need to go another week. Psalm chapter 62, one says this, only, say only. Only in God do you find rest. That's the only place. See, there are some people who have mastered recreation on Sunday. Sunday has actually become National Recreation Day. For in most of America, it's not the Lord's Day, it's Recreation Day. It's the day you go to the mall. It's the day you go to the game. It's the game you go to a play. It's the game that you go out and have fun, but most Americans have forgotten the God component. If you forget the God component, there will be no real, long-lasting rest achieved in your life. It's all about Psalm 62, only in God do I find rest. So we have to slow down for God. We have to be still and know that he's God. One of the, the things about Grow Truck is we want to know God, get connected, discover your purpose, and make a difference. Number one is know God. How? By being still, by taking time to Sabbath, by taking time to, to spend with the Lord. You reconnect with God, and you also reconnect with yourself. I want you to think about who you are as an individual. Do you know yourself? How well do you know yourself? Most of us, when we get up, we look in the the mirror in the morning and we see some some flesh and bones there and we think, that's Pastor Tom right there. I see him in the mirror. But there's more to me than this body, right? There's also something behind these eyes called a mind. And, And this mind thinks. This mind creates. This mind has all these different emotions that go through it. But there's also more to me than even my imaginations. There's something called the spirit man. In Sabbath, when you slow down, you reconnect with God. And as you reconnect with God, you start realigning your own humanity with God himself. You start realigning your your body and your soul and your spirit and you get into this unity, this this place where there's a, a calmness because you're not divided any longer, you're not disjointed any longer. 
And you can also reconnect with other people in your family and in the body of Christ. Here's the last thing I want you to understand. Number three and finally, Sabbath must, say must, Sabbath must be pursued. You have to pursue rest. Now that doesn't make sense. You would think when it comes to rest, I don't do anything, but, but no, no, you have to be intentional about this. You have to be very strategic when it comes to Sabbath. The word literally means to stop. Stop whatever it is that is keeping you from resting. Stop worrying, stop being afraid. Stop working, stop striving, stop fighting. Stop thinking that, that you're in control because you're really not. Control's an illusion. And allow God to fill you with everything that you need. There are five quick signs that you may need a Sabbath right now. Number one, you feel overwhelmed by everything you need to do. Think about it. Do you feel overwhelmed? Do you feel overwhelmed by the Christmas season that's coming? Life is meant to be lived at a much slower pace. The Chinese symbol for busyness is two symbols put together. One is the heart and one is the word kill. So they believe busyness kills the heart. Number two, a second sign you need Sabbath. You feel like you're always in a hurry. 26% of women, 21% of men say they always feel rushed. Carl Jung says hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. Number three, you often feel tired and weary. We already talked about that. Number four, you have a diminished capacity to care. I love my wife. I really do. But there are times when she bugs me. She's not here, so I can talk about her this way, right? (laughs) She's out there somewhere. But listen to me. 99% of the time she bugs me when I'm tired, exhausted, hurried, busy, all of these things we're talking about. When I'm rested, when I've spent time in the presence of God, she can do almost anything and it won't bother me. She could say anything, do anything, and, and it'll be like water off a duck's back. I won't even notice it because 1 Corinthians says love hardly even notices when others do it wrong. When I start noticing other people doing me wrong, I know there's something wrong with me, not with them. That I need to reconnect, that I need to stop right where I'm at and spend some more time with my heavenly Father. I need to cease and desist in that moment. Some of you, when you see a commercial on the TV that that talks about the flood victims or that talks about a cleft palate, or a commercial that that talks about a need somewhere in society. And, And when your heart just reaches out to it, many times that's because you're rested. If there comes a time when you go, man, I've seen one too many commercials. What it's saying is you need to spend some time with God that your capacity to care has been, has been hampered some way. This is the question I like to ask myself. How much do I care about the things I care about? Because if my care meter goes down, I need to spend time with God. Fifth sign, you feel like you don't have enough time. Anybody ever feel that way? The Silicon Valley makes us feel that way, doesn't it? If you work in this valley... They make you feel like you have to work 80, 90 hours a week just to get by. Because if you don't, someone else will, right? If you're not there on the weekend, someone's going to be there on the weekend. Trust and know that I am God. You can take time off. You can take a Sabbath. In the Old Testament, it wasn't just Saturdays. There were Sabbath feasts and Sabbath weeks and Sabbath years They would take entire years off and nobody would work. Could you imagine how much fun that would be? I mean, we just get to gather whenever we want and and celebrate and, and God takes care of every single need. That's his promise, not just to Israel. He's still promising that today. When you begin your week 
by spending it with the Lord, what you're saying is, is God, you're my number one. You, you're my priority. I trust you more than I even trust myself. I'm tithing my first day back to you. So what do you do when you stop? Well, you spend time with the Lord. You stop and smell the roses. Does anybody remember that song from the 70s? You got to stop and smell Okay, I'm the only old person in the house. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. The first verse goes like this. Hey, mister, where are you going in such a hurry? Don't you think it's time you realize there's a whole lot more to life than work and worry? The sweetest things in life are free. The sweetest things in life are free. He says you, you got to count your many blessings every day. So, so what are some free things we can do that are, that are Sabbath moments? I think we got a great opportunity living in California. You can go to the beach. And you can stand on the beach and watch the waves, and that can be a Sabbath moment. Standing in God's creation often helps you understand God. Two days ago, I'm, I'm in my kitchen, and, and I'm looking out the window, and, and I've noticed some, some leaves are, are falling, okay? And, and then I, I see this big tree in the back, and the leaves are going like this. The wind is going through them, and, and the thought crosses my mind, I think God's waving at me right now. That's what I started thinking. God's waving at me right now. Anybody have a hummingbird feeder? And the birds fly to that hummingbird feeder? That can be a, a Sabbath moment. Sitting in the boat on a lake fishing can be a Sabbath moment. Watching flowers, gardening in your backyard, singing in the car. Drinking a cup of coffee can go from an addictive thing to a Sabbath moment where you appreciate the flavor, the aroma, and that God has put something so special into a bean that I can, I can enjoy this on a regular basis, shooting baskets in the gym all by yourself, watching your children sleep or your spouse sleep in the middle of the night. It can be a Sabbath moment. Honoring the veterans like we did, where you take two minutes out of your service to remember the sacrifice that they made and how that it's impacted your life is a Sabbath moment. Two final things, you need to have some solitude every now and then. Henry Nguyen says that in solitude, I get rid of my scaffolding. Scaffolding is the stuff that artificially holds you up and it makes you feel important. It helps you to forget things. So, so when we fasted earlier on in this fall, fasting is refraining from eating. Solitude is refraining from, from everything else. It's refraining from people, from sounds, from society, from entertainment, from your iPad, from your iPhone. We need some solitude. Jesus was a master of solitude. Finally, silence. Let's take one moment of silence. Close your eyes. Silence is the condition of true listening. If you desire to hear the voice of God, you have to find that place. See, we come into church services and, and we begin with, with praise, we're worshiping, we're, we're jumping up and down, we're getting all excited. That's not where you hear God's voice most of the time. You hear his voice in silence. It's a still, small, quiet voice. God speaks into the silence. Let me close with one final story. In Revelation chapter one, we get a, a picture of what happens to John, one of the disciples. He's probably 90 some years old at this time, and he's been exiled to an island in the Mediterranean. He's the only person on this island. He's there all by himself. There's nobody else around. And the scripture says it is Sunday morning. It's the Lord's day. And it says in verse 10 that he is in the spirit. It means he's having a Sabbath moment. Sunday morning, having a Sabbath moment. And the scripture says he hears a very loud voice like a trumpet. 
And the trumpet says, hey, hey, I've got a word for you. I, I want to speak something to you, and, and it's really important. So you have to write this stuff down because you're going to share it with somebody else. And in verse 12, this is what it says. He turns around to see the voice. Can you see a voice? No. So what's going on in John's life? The voice of God is so real, he thinks God's right there with him. The voice is so tangible, he believes there's got to be someone else on this island right now, so he turns around to see who it is, and it's God talking to him. That's what God wants to do with you. But you have to be still and know that I'm God. I will be still for you are with me. I will be still for you are with me. I will be still I will be still for you are with me I will be still for you are with me I will be still for you are with me I will be still I will be still sing it again I will be still for you are Just trust and know that I am God and I'm in control. I am your God. Sing it again. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Just trust and know that I am God and I'm in control I am still 